We'll begin with a round of this conversation in poetry. So I'll start it off by reading a poem, and then someone, I don't, I don't know if we decided who's going second. We'll okay. dump, jump in like double dutch. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like double dutch, so yeah. whoever feels the spirit, jump in. So someone will then um, respond with a poem. No, you're fine. Um, so whatever I read, they will take something from it and then find one of their pieces to read and then it'll keep going. <laughs> We're gonna do three rounds of that. So that's nine poems, quick math, hopefully that's correct. Um, that'll be nine poems and then we'll do a conversation in conversation about what we did with poems. Um, and then we will open it up to you all if you have questions for us. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with a new poem. Oh, yeah, yeah, y'all didn't know. No, <laughs> I no, I knew. That to you. I knew, I'm ready. <laughs> you knew. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you'll be able to, it'll be fine. It's a new poem that you probably, you may have heard already. Um, and it's about Harriet Tubman. I thought I would start with Harriet Tubman because earlier today I spoke with um, the students at Tuscaloosa Magnet School, I believe is the name of the school. Um, and I talked about how I started writing and it was because of Harriet Tubman, interestingly enough. Um, I read a poem about her by Eloise Greenfield mm -hmm. and it inspired me to write poems, to keep connecting with my own history and with that power that's within us if we've read Audre Lorde, we know that she describes poetry as that light within us that helps us to survive. And I really found that light when I recited a poem about Harriet Tubman. So this is a poem about Tubman um, that I've written as a part of a series um, for the Alabama School of Fine Arts Music Department. They have commissioned someone to create um, an orchestral piece for these poems about Tubman. So this one talks about um, her injury, which was caused by an anvil, I believe, to her head um, by the person who owned her, and it caused her visions, which led her to escape. Holy Head Harriet. The eye of God is planted between my brow. The eye of God is opening at the top of my head. The eye of God was made with blood, was made from the hands of an ungodly master, the eye of God pierced my head in two. The eye of God said, look, and I saw it. The eye of God showed me rivers and fields and trees that would shelter me on my way. The eye of God told me I would not be enslaved. Hmm. The eye of God showed me all the shades of my humanity, showed me how to see my people, my people. My people are the eye of God too. My people bloom from my brow. My people are the top of my head and the soles of my feet. My people are made with blood. My people are hurting at the hands of an ungodly master. My people have pierced me in two. My people said, look, and I saw them. My people showed me their blood in the rivers. My people showed me their blood in the fields. My people showed me their bodies in the trees and the shelter I could make for them on my way. My people told me they were not enslaved. My people showed me all the shades of my humanity. My people showed me how to see my people, how to see my God. My God, my God and my people are made of the same cloth, the same blood. My people showed up in my vision and I said, oh, God, show me how to make a way. Second sight, one, let the spirits gather here in my mother's eye. Let some moonstruck apparition walk her into the eternal. Three days the dogs will bark at our door and the old women sing, their voices smooth as ruby elixir, their tobacco skin soft as clay. Let her sickness depart. Let morphine days vaporize like breath in winter, let the preacher say the end. Tell him pour the wine and blood. Let her earthly dreams be finished. Come, gather beneath the swollen moon and touch this life, fragile and resilient as skin. Two, 
My mother swears that death walked in her room last night, smiled at her and shook her foot. But I bear witness only to the scream that shook the house in each day's obituary of sudden causes. Three, the lamp shines on her distended face. I listen for each breath that rattles, spirit in a sack, esprit, aspire, expire, expiration date unknown. She has come to this. The old ways will not come to me. My palms turn outward and prayers fall through my open hands. Old women sing. I hiss at the moon and pray for sight. Wondrous and mystic light, embrace my soul, inflame my vacant eye. This is from my poetry collection, Mend, and um, in it, um, one of the women is in a very dazed state um, after, having been, have, after having been experimented on mm -hmm. by the doctor. The day we were born, we belonged to you. These clay sculpted women, yours. There is no respite to offer. Such exquisite wrongs remain. Our vulvas, the future you wrote against the back of your hand. Born to be seen by you, we are the bodies you strive against. The triangle axis gleams. It is June, your glinting silver blade new, you slick as butter. So yours, we wonder if the saliva in our mouths is still ours. We're denied water to protect sutures. My parched tongue circles for wisps of spit. You could leave me this one thing. Thief, all night you drink water from my body. All night you drink water from my body. You sneak from your bed, taking the worn way towards the wood shack, over the chickweed and white clover. We call it shack. You say, hospital. You stop bedside, and full of need, you straddle me, squat down, your haunches hovering low, graze my throbbing vulva. You claw the back of my neck so my head falls aside like a pansy. Then you call for the water in my body to rise. Come up, you sing. Dizzied and stunned, I watch it rising like so many beads of wine. In the mornings, I am bare. I am shut. I am dead where I lie, already plucked. <clears throat> I cannot talk about the South without talking about black women. <laughs> My grandmothers made America, made the fibers that made us warm, made us invincible, heroines. To tell you who they are, I must start with who they are not. Mm. Servants, kitchen-bound mammies, silently obedient wives. We can't, in our modern comforts, imagine the survival they learned was theirs to claim, can't hold the light they burned through this colonial darkness. What tricks this nation, this American South, pulled minute by minute to keep my grandmothers convinced? The body you're in is not enough. Your race and your gender work together to mark you less, to mark you takeable. But what they didn't know, 
was that my grandmothers still had an unmovable strength, enough to build a bridge from here to heaven. I know when I leave this broken earth, I'll find them there, sweetening every hour. My grandmothers raised a generation of American men. There is no other way to say this. Look at any Southern family and you'll find somewhere in a past most will not claim a black woman. These men who call themselves bootstrapping and self-made, somewhere there's a black woman and her unthanked hands who mm. lifted them to where they are now. Mm. My father tells a story of the sons of his grandmother's employers, how they, instead of the pension she was promised, decided to give her a damned old tire, an old suitcase, dusty in the yard. What thanks is this for the years she raised that family, for the care they cannot forget? My father could never forgive those men, their Southern tradition, their American tradition. Even now, they tell us black women are gonna save this whole nation mm -hmm. with votes, or magic, or our style taken and renamed. But this is no longer the land of masses and mammies, and we are only superheroines for our own daughters and sons. My grandmothers did not give their lives for me to keep nursing this country, to keep shucking and jiving in a bizarro American dream. My grandmothers are worth more than this corrupt remembering. Now there is no room for the Dixieland lie. We no longer hold these truths you made us accept. Under God, yes, we hear him singing a song of powerful love despite the united hate of America. Grandmothers, women made of salt and spirit, you are faith continuous. Continue us. Raise us to be heroes and heroines, to tell this country that we are not mules, not beasts. You, an army of workers and wives, we hid our fears and woes in your indestructible, ever-present ladiness. Mm. The blood you pass down to us is all we will ever need to save our lives. Feel like I might want to read that other poem now. <laughs> okay. But that's all. You want me to grab it for you? I'll grab it. Okay. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Sorry, y'all. No <laughs> Technical break. Ashley did this. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a new poem. It's, um, um, I'm going to say just a second about it. Um, so my daughter uh, lives in Memphis. She's a lawyer. And she was um, on Martin Luther King Boulevard at a light when she was, um, got caught in the middle of a gunfight, mm. um, people shooting at each other. And I wrote this poem for my daughter. I hear America singing the blues. Three birds, their fat bodies mangoes among the winter branches, belted blues outside my house the morning my father died. Nobody foretold it. Not even the doctor, though the old folks would later claim the birds as sign. 3 a.m., pitch black January, a song loud and full-throated, troubling the Alabama morning. And my father, not knowing his heart would quit that day, filled his thermos with coffee, put on press pants, starch shirt, shoes polished to sparkle, while my mother sang when Sonny gets blue with Johnny Mathis on the clock radio. I was dreaming of red bell bottoms and new white kids, throwing my legs out as I leaned back on a blue swing. My ponytails, a tandem of happiness, red bows tied just so. Again and again, I flung my body against the air, kicked, 
hovered like a held note, like the momentary stillness before the hawk dives and murders its startled prey. Then and only then would I launch, as only a child can launch, my whole body and heart unafraid of landing or the blues of hard ground that always comes one day. My father kissed me minutes before his body wedged itself between tub and toilet, before my mother, a singing bird, heard the song his body made when it hit the floor. His name became a question repeating, so loud it stopped me mid-swing, so loud the bird stopped to listen as she called and called in the silence of his departing soul. The morning my father died, Martin Luther King Jr. was 39 and Lyndon Johnson slept uneasy. Bessie Smith, long dead, was singing in their heads. Nobody knows you when you're down and out, she sang to the drowning men, to a whole nation underwater, on fire, on the precipice of new tunes. Where were the blues going? Outside war, on poverty, in the streets, in Vietnam, where the jungle bristled with singing birds. My cousin was fighting there, the one my father raised as son, the one who later gave me a pearl ring, told me the story of Okinawan divers, had a wife, daughter, and good times. One day that cousin would steal from me for a fix. The shambles of his life shuffled like a losing hand, like a story only the blues can tell. I saw him for the last time, stranger and relative, hand shoved in his pocket prison style, walking down my street. Then watched him uncalled until he disappeared beyond the tree line into memory. Maybe he died that day. Maybe he went to rehab. Maybe he is alive and well and diving for pearls. Pearls more delicate than bullets that whizzed past my daughter's car as she waited at the crossroad of MLK Avenue and B.B. King Boulevard in Memphis. Where was she to turn, assaulted by flying pearls, caught between young men set on the blues? She feared the song her body might make, the sound of her mother's song, a whole nation of mothers, a hallelujah chorus of Ma Rainey, their throats raw, the color of red bell bottoms. Lord, going to sleep now, just now I got bad news to try to dream away my troubles, counting these blues. Ma Rainey, tell us your dream now. What will our future be? We're stuck in these blues, Ma Rainey. Can't do nothing but wait and see. Four months after my father died, Mahalia told the Lord to take King's hand. He was tired, weary, and plumb worn out. The thud of his body hitting the balcony, the repetition of these themes, second line keeps playing, blues replicating like rifle shots, the grocery, the store, the mosque, the church, I am black and blue with singing, the synagogue, in the street, everywhere, 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 bodies falling like soldiers in the jungle, like children hurling themselves off swings, indifferent to the ground, or birds that bellow the blues, loud and raw-throated, full of lament and portend, and we go on as if the world is not primed for destruction, as if each day is as ordinary as the morning my father got up, put on his clothes, reached for his cigarettes, and died there on the bathroom floor while my mother sang with Johnny Mathis, love is gone, so what does it matter? And I dreamed of summer. Mm. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, last year, um, my last day of the semester, and um, Ashley's inauguration, as I would call it, yes. 
Um, I was headed down to Montgomery, and my husband also had an, an event in Montgomery, so he was headed down to Montgomery too in a separate car. He was about 20 minutes ahead of me um, and called me and told me that uh, he had stopped at a gas station for gas and he was randomly attacked um, and um, was, was stabbed in the back um, by just someone at the gas station. Okay. And then I wrote this book. And y'all can tell me about the title while I'm still working out the title. <laughs> so if you have other ideas, you let me know after. Okay. To a Karen. <laughs> or. Yes. <laughs> In this way, all becomes sacred. Mm. Police, sit up a graph. Police, a bizarre attack, Tennessee woman assaults man at Prattville Hotel, stabs another at gas station. Mm. WFSA 12 News, staff, December 2021. You wouldn't know. I first nursed our children beside him, nor how in one glance I noted he held care for both my wince and the infant need fastened, its mouth the sting and quiver of a thrush. Somewhere a whole tongue knots in the bottom of your head. Outside the sweat interior of your vehicle that morning, gasoline fumes sent heads nodding into days of scrolling, mm -hmm. fingertips to pockets to count change. My husband's back magnetic as he picked up crayon debris, orange peels, bubblegum wrappers from the floorboard. There were your hands too, one winding hard on the vibrating wheel the other's thumb stroking the teeth of a knife. All of this body has held his. He doesn't belong to me. I could never sign my name to the known and unknown planet of his body. I have not even drawn a heart. And he has loved me enough to leave me unmarked, no dark sign of his visits to this colony. Hmm. The interbreath. Praise to conspiring. Praise for woven cotton strands and the work of multi-hued hands gathering yards for machinery. Brown eyes overseeing darting thread and seam that became his shirt. Praise the wind factor now that urges him to slip on his suit coat too, and the breastplate all conspiring in protection. Hmm. The air, a high of entropy and fury, the curse of what brought you here, knocking your unknown heart and charged knife, seeking anyone to open. Hmm. And my beloved glows, praise, both your palms slip on the handle an unwieldy edge. Hmm. Praise synapse and startle, neurons that made quick journey, spun him around to face you, fading colonizer claiming access to a brown body with weapon raised like a standard. Praise be to Yahweh, Nisi, breath of all that surged against the knife, sunk alongside capillaries, Vessels, dear undershirt, praise hmm. that I was nowhere near to lay my hands on you. Yes. <laughs> so this is our last round. Mm -hmm. I love that poem so it's much. Beautiful. And you really didn't have to do that to us with that poem, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> you did not have to. Um, so I'm going to end. Um, 
my section and then you two will go. Um, I really love the idea of praising the thing, mm -hmm. praising the thing that is hurting us, but also praising the thing that stops the thing from hurting us. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very powerful notion and I think it's what's kept us alive here in America. Um, and when I say us, I mean black people here in America, it's kept us alive for a very long time. So this um, poem that I'm gonna close with has two epigraphs that I will read. Um, and it is called The Hymn of the Dogwood Tree. Oh. And the first um, epigraph is a poem. It's a lynching postcard poem from 1908. Um, if you're not aware, lynching postcards were very popular in America at a certain time. Um, and basically what would happen is people would have a lynching, they would take a picture, make it into a postcard, mm -hmm. write uh, either a happy message to their friends or more likely they would write a message to their local black family to say this is what's going to happen to you if you don't act right. So this poem reads, this is only the branch of a dogwood tree, an emblem of white supremacy, a lesson once taught in the pioneer school that this is a land of white man's rule. Mm. The red man once in an early day was told by the whites to mend his way. The Negro now, by eternal grace, must learn to stay in the Negro's place. In the sunny South, the land of the free, let the white supreme forever be. Let this a warning to all Negroes be, or they'll suffer the fate of the dogwood tree. And that's what went on a lot of these postcards, that poem. The other quote is from Kimberly, Kimberly Daniels, who I believe is a representative of somewhere in Florida or of Florida. And she said this thing that I'm about to read that I thought was just outrageous. She said, I thank God for slavery. She's black, I should say. I thank God for slavery. If it wasn't for slavery, I might be somewhere in Africa worshiping a tree. That is what she said. I think she's missing a lot there. And I, it would take too long for me to really unpack all of it. Oh God. But something that I clung to um, was that to me, God is in everything, including the tree. Like you can't say a oh, worshiping a tree is bad because a tree is not of God, everything is of God. Yeah. So the hymn of the dogwood tree. Let us praise the roots and the leaf, praise the dangling branch, praise the tender throat, mm. the wailing neck, praise. Let us gather at this dogwood altar, praise each vein and the blood, the blood, Jesus, call us home and whole. Even here, we praise. Praise each shaking branch, the sigh of the bark rubbed raw. Dark southern trees, so far from our faraway home. Mm. Praise each dogwood oak, the pine of the slave ship's never ending hull. Let us praise, Lord, this tree holds us up up, up, so heaven's not so far away. Up, so high, they mistake our praise for cries. Hmm. I love that poem. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm, I'm going to close out on a poem that also connects um, history with now, <laughs> so um, I'm going to do, if I can find it, I don't know my, where things are in my own book. Um, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Don't say sorry. Um, Okay, well I can't find that poem, so I'll do this one. Um, it's called, Oh Say Can You See. And the epigram is, of course, from the Star Spangled Banner, Francis Scott Key. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave about killing black people. Okay, Oh Say Can You See. Those slaves at Fort McHenry never had a chance to kneel, probably dead before they hit the ground. 
Like that boy shot 20 times, his cell phone still smoking in his hand, his grandmother's backyard a burial ground, not sacred enough, nor was his body a temple the cops dare not enter. Maybe if he had wrapped himself in stars and stripes, someone would have unholstered a hand, placed it on the heart, and begun to sing. Patriotic songs of the brave lift every voice. My soul looks back. Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. How many black bodies must fall to hallow these urban battlefields? This is not a rhetorical question. I am asking for the exact body count. Mm -hmm. So this poem that I'm gonna read um, is, is um, a poem that I wrote this week, so it's real new. I thought you were going to challenge yes. us to like read something we had just wrote, mm -hmm. so I'm sorry about that. Um, so this is based on a photograph uh, by Ramel Ross, um, who's an African-American photographer, and right now the exhibit is in uh, Auburn mm -hmm. um, at the Fine Arts Museum there. Um, and so I, um, chose to respond to a photograph of an African-American woman. Um, and yeah, um, she is holding the viewer accountable and, and um, the, the poem is directed at the viewer. Shaquan, hmm. after Amel Ross's photograph. As if we are here, meeting eye to eye, consider not assessing, as I, as I am infinite beads hmm. past your abacus. And you cannot know this road or the soft business of my hands, or how the trees study sheltering and no black joy is not merely transcendence. Because hmm. I don't think about European Americans at any variation of cookout. <laughs> <laughs> where, ba where bass notes open for Betty Wright to sing a song even her own mama told her not to sing. Hmm on account of how free it is. <laughs> As if we are not eye to eye, you keep looking. While you look like you smell like outside. <laughs> you look like you've been thrown away. You look like a tinderbox dog with eyes as big as saucers. Mm. Not to mention your head so big it almost eclipsed my picture. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, I let my music breathe air, free to wander, while yours breathes like a slow dying bass. This joy, like a yellow brighter than sun, I hope you get something like it, some off-brand loop fruit, not quite the same. <laughs> The light basks in my hair, and it cannot be known, like the truth, that my boot size is a number. The ground is still damp enough to mark my tracks. Mm. The road is clear, and you should really worry about where I'm going. Huh. Nice. Well, I was really just still sitting in the poem, but I'm going to switch. <laughs> um, and I'm very excited to just look at that poem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm glad that that's the one you're going to be submitting Thank to you. the to the Southern Humanities Review. Um, so at this point, we're just going to do a short little conversation. I'm keeping an eye on time. In fact, Michael, when did you say this was over? What is our... 
over time. We got five in one of the officially, but it can Okay. 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 We'll we'll play it by ear, but if I feel the room feeling like it's time for us to go, I'm happy to say and thank you so much for coming <laughs> yeah. so that you can go. Um, but I just want to ask you all first, how was that for you? Had you done this before? What was the feeling? Did you, did you feel, I'll say it this way, I know both of you were a little like, oh no, what are we going to do? <laughs> but how did it turn out for you? I think it was great. But It felt really great for me. I was a little nervous about it. I thought I had to bring, as I told you, every single poem I had ever written. <laughs> I I'm like, how do I prepare for this? Um, but my only context was one time I was doing a reading outside <coughs> under a tent in this huge field and it started raining and you know people were like kind of moving around and thinking about leaving the tent and I just kept reading and I started responding to the rain as I was reading mm -hmm. and the sound of the rain and so then I started pacing out the poems like collaborating with the rain. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's, yeah. that was my only context. I was like, okay, well, I, I could do that in the moment. Maybe this is something like that. Wow, yeah. that's so cool. So now I haven't done anything exactly like this, but yeah, I think um, whenever you do a reading, you're always kind of sensing the audience anyway. So um, I don't always, I always go in with maybe a few poems I'm going to read, but then I just sort of think, oh, what, what is the spirit telling me to read right at this moment? So um, it, was, it was fun, yeah. I'm glad it was fun. I really enjoyed it. The yeah. hard part for me is that I always am like ready to sit in the poems that I'm hearing. Yeah. And then you have to respond. So it's just like, wait, wait, wait. Like, which mind do I follow? The one that's right. still with Shaquan or the one that's still with these birds or <laughs> whatever I'm supposed to do after all of that. Um, so it's very exciting and it makes me want to write actually like I'm mm -hmm. itching to write something Yeah, um, which is a nice feeling to have yeah. I don't write every day because I don't want to honestly um, Which maybe is a controversy to be a poet and not want to write every day But I like to as Jackie said follow the spirit um, which leads me to another question um, Both of your work um, is very concerned with the truth um, which is why I love it so much. Both of you as people are concerned with the truth, which yeah. is why we associate, I think, yeah. too. Um, and so I wonder, I know for me sometimes, when the spirit is leading me to write something, mm -hmm. I'm like, but I don't want to do that. Like, that is scary, or that is a lot, or that's mm -hmm. my husband getting stabbed, or, you know, mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of scary things that um, we tackle. So I wondered if you each could talk about those moments when, where the poem is leading you like it has to drag you there, basically. Mm -hmm. Anybody? So um, I'm older than both of you, so I have, I have, I think I have lived past the age of having to worry about it. You know, I'm I'm headed to that age when um, I'm looking forward to 80. I'm not 80, but I'm looking for it <laughs> in you know, a few decades being 80 because then I will say exactly everything <laughs> I think and invite you to come at me. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm almost at that point now. I mean, I don't have to, there's nothing I have to do. You know, there's nothing I have to do. And so, um, you know, it's great to be a tenured full professor. It's like, you know, fire me, <laughs> fight, whatever. <laughs> Um, and so it's a, it's a really wonderful time to be alive, you know, um, that I just, I write whatever's in my head. It, it comes out and if it makes you mad, good. Something <laughs> make you think about things. So I sort of think you can just already do that, Jackie. Like yeah. nobody's coming at you. I know. Well, okay. you'd be surprised. Sometimes mm -hmm. people get a little nervous mm -hmm. about things I say mm -hmm. and they but come and they... try to explain things to me. Mm -hmm. They try to explain. We don't like that. <laughs> Not at all. Um, go ahead. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle for me. It's still a struggle for me. Um, I just turned 40 and I'm super happy about that because Wait, I've what? heard a lot of people, yeah, I just turned 40 in June. Um, I heard that a lot of people like start saying whatever they want to say when they're 40. So I'm really waiting. I've been looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, and But I've really had to work very hard at it. Mm -hmm. um, 
telling the truth, especially about anything that has to do with my family. Yeah. It's so hard yeah. um, you're, uh, to constantly be thinking about protecting mm -hmm. the people that you love. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that has helped me was thinking about um, the idea of speaking the truth, speaking the truth to power, mm -hmm. you know, and like, I have to be good to myself, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like yeah. I have to tell the truth for myself. And um, I started writing a book. I'm working on a book right now that is um, more biographical, just from my own life. Um, <coughs> and there are poems that deal with childhood and everything, and they don't paint, you know, people in a flattering light. I do think one of the things I try to do is to put myself out there as not being a perfect person as much as possible. Like if I write a poem about, you know, one of my parents or write something that is unflattering about mm -hmm. someone else, I try to just put myself under the same microscope. So I have a poem in there about just being like really sweaty and smelly, like being stink and like a stink <laughs> person. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, um, it's an ongoing uh, struggle and, but I have, really been working on that I think all year long mm. like challenging myself and um, you know the writers that have been around me have been challenging me to no tell the truth what do the camera mm. see don't try to disguise this yeah mm -hmm. I feel very similar to you Koya um, I, I don't struggle saying the true things about like America mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. politics I can do that all day long, mm -hmm. like, and it's easy. I mean, we're all here. It's very easy to say, hey, that's bad. Yeah. Like, it's very <laughs> simple. Um, and I feel empowered to do so because I feel like I'm doing, you know, the good work, doing mm -hmm. the Lord's work to help us all um, become educated and, you know, try to liberate ourselves. But when it comes to me, um, I definitely, as you said, I struggled to kind of uncover that part of myself. Mm -hmm. And with family, I'm afraid of my family, like, <laughs> hating me. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I try to run everything Same. by my mom, like, hey, is somebody gonna hate me for Ooh. this? <laughs> like, should I Ooh. word it this way? And there's a lot of things I want to write, which I don't think I will write right now. Mm -hmm. I'll wait until everybody's in heaven and then I can <laughs> write about it here. And then when I get up there, they can't fight me because it's heaven, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I, I have written a few poems which talk about um, people in my family, um, difficult people in my family. Mm -hmm. And I think being a poet, although you have to tell the truth, you also can like do it poetically. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what has saved me mm -hmm. to like not exactly <laughs> say the exact thing. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it truthfully, but like there's a metaphor right there. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you can be distracted by this metaphor and then my like creepy uncle is over here and you can't really see him, but I know he's there. Um, do you write about your neighbors? Because I write about my neighbors. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, so that poem, sidebar. The poem that Jackie has in her book about, what it, tell us what it's called, Jackie. It's called, um, uh, For My Neighbor Whose Good Intentions Are Wolf Pelt. Okay, so this poem is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> Jackie does not have a problem telling people exactly what they need to know oh at all. Like, at the end of this poem, I've never heard Jackie curse in my life. Let me just say that. This poem curses, and it, it earns a curse word. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to be like you. I'm trying to like say, you know what? I can say, even to say a curse word. Like yeah. I agonize, like the word damned is in the poem about the grandmother. Yeah, yeah. I don't curse in my regular life normally, unless there's a really extreme situation sure. in which I really just got to say it. And I worry so much about like my image or what people are going to think about me and oh no I said that word and it's written there and oh my gosh now like every grandmother in America is going to hate like <laughs> it's a lot. Um, so I too am working toward being more authentic because it really does matter. Mm -hmm. I mean I think the poets who we love, mm -hmm. we love them exactly. because they were exactly. who they were mm -hmm. and they said what they had to say mm -hmm. and they didn't, like, maybe they cared but they didn't care enough to not say those things. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Um, I have one more question and then I would love to open it up to you all. Um, so this last question is, since this is called past is present mm. and we all discuss um, issues of social justice and personal justice and all of that, what do you think poetry can teach us about ourselves? What can it teach us about our country? Is it a part of the revolution, personal, political? Any of that you want to answer, you can take. 
Can you say that again? One more time. I zoned out. What can poetry teach us about ourselves or our nation or the political hullabaloo? And is it a part of liberation of ourselves or of this whole space? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yeah. I, I'm sure I'll go. Mine will be short. I obviously think that poetry can liberate us. I think yeah. because on an individual level, um, it liberates me as a writer. Um, if I am liberated, then the folks who are around me in my community um, have access to my liberation, and they are better because I am liberated. Um, so uh, for, from an individual perspective, certainly, um, I could speak to a societal perspective, but I'll let Jackie do that. Um, so for me, that's the function of art. I mean, is to um, liberate, to free people. <laughs> to, and the function of the poet. Um, the poet is, for me, the truth teller. And so um, I, the poets that I admire pretty much come from um, revolutionary sort of movements. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, because that's important. And the reason I think it's so important in poetry and in art bec is because um, art is the thing that we allow in even if we don't allow other things in. We, um, if, if you, you know, I can't, I'm not, never going to be a politician because I'm, yeah, that's <laughs> not me. And so, um, and so I, I sort of have two talents, teaching and writing. And so the, the, um, when you write something or when you create something, people look at it. If it's a piece of art, if it's a piece of literature, they take it in and they allow themselves to sort of take it in. Now, they may, may not agree with it, they may, may not like it, but there's a kind of a disarming quality to it because it is in, in entertaining or mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, um, I use a lot of humor in my poetry that disarms people. You can say, you'd be, you know, you'd be surprised what you can get away with saying if it's funny. Um, and so I think that, for me, is the important function of art, to liberate, to show us the world. I think the poets show us the world as it is and not always as we imagine it to be. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's open it up to you all. If anybody has a question, feel free to raise your hand. Yes? Hi, how are you? Hello. Hi. Oh, wow. I want to ask you all, like, at what point in your life did you realize that you couldn't control how people reacted to your like, authenticity? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That we realized, right? Or that we, that we accepted it. Right, like, like, mm -hmm. like, knowing that you can't control their reaction no matter what they're saying. Mm hmm. I'll try to respond. I think it's a case by case basis, for real. I think it's like an ongoing pursuit. You know, like sometimes you're more successful at it than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. There are definitely things I'm still surprised by. Mm -hmm. And I still have those moments where I'm like, whoa, I really can't control what people do say or think about me. Um, but if I had to like pinpoint, mm. Good grief. I mean, I think I first learned that people would think things about me and I wouldn't be able to control it. I learned that when I was five, mm -hmm. but I haven't, I didn't accept it fully, mm -hmm. I think, until maybe high school, college. I don't know. Honestly, as an adult, like in my 20s, I really came to terms with, okay, let me not fight the do they like me battle because mm -hmm. yeah. it's unwinnable, you know. Um, yeah, so I think, and I'm still kind of going through that, especially now with this position, like, oh, yeah. we don't have the time, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> really, I, every day it's almost like, oh, wait, okay, I can't control how I'm perceived, even in ways that people think are good, like, I can't control tokenism, for example. Yeah. I've tried to control that my entire life, and yeah. I, you can't, it's impossible. Um, 
So anyway, I'll stop there because I feel like I could really just keep on talking about this. But I was going to say um, the sort of same thing. I think I realized it pretty early on in my life, like you know, like six or seven, um, because I was thrust into a lot of uh, institutions, spaces, and situations where I was often the only child of color. Mm -hmm. And so people say really crazy things to you. And I'm not even talking about mean things. I'm just talking about things based on perception that are just weird. Um, and so I think I had to learn early on to have a very strong sense of who I was and my identity and not worry at all about what other people thought about me or how they perceived me and I'm with Ashley whether it's good or bad whether it sounds good or bad you just have to um, and I of course I, I have an advantage of not having come up during a period in social media where everything was based on being liked you know it was like who cares <laughs> people like you people's opinions are you know just their opinions so um, is that something you struggle with is that something it is um, so here's the thing, um, people's opinions are like, you know, a roller coaster. They're up and down, they're all around. They don't even remember what they thought, you know. Um, and nine times out of ten, this is the absolute truth. Um, people are so busy thinking about themselves, they really aren't thinking about you. It's just sometimes things come out of their mouths, or they're having a bad day, or their foot hurts, or whatever. So I would not put a, I would not put a lot of stock in people's opinions of you, good or bad. I'm gonna tell y'all a real quick Hank Lazar story since we're at the University of Alabama. Hank Lazar, uh, they may not know who that is, but Hank Lazar um, taught me American uh, poetry. Um, he's a wonderful poet, written tons and tons of books, um, retired from University of Alabama. And Hank Lazar had written tons of books and he sent this article out to get published and it got rejected, right? And every time he would get a rejection letter, and he was well established, he would say, what do they know, right? Mm -hmm. So he sent it out again, got rejected again. So this happened like 10 times. So finally, he gets this letter saying, you know, ah, oh, we want to publish this, this is wonderful. And he shows it to his wife and he says, see, it's wonderful. And his wife says, what do they know? <laughs> That's how you got to live your life, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're welcome. That's good advice. Um, okay, so I'm looking at my watch. Maybe one more question from the audience. Okay, like three of you raised your hands. I don't know how to... <laughs> fairly uh, do Just that. call everybody, about three people that raise their hands. Okay, so I'll, at the same time, they just- It's 434. I'm okay. saying we got some time, so you could just call. Okay, so I guess we'll just, Michael, you're standing up. That makes me nervous. <laughs> Let's go with three questions. And okay. Fantastic. Okay. So we'll go with you and then you and then, did you have your hand up here? Someone Somebody over here. here. Oh, you, just, okay. Yeah. So those three of you, you know who you are. So can we start with you? Mm -hmm. um, so hello. Hi. Hello. What does Black Joy look like for you as a writer? <laughs> Cook Alice. <laughs> but I realized lately that the feeling of, I don't mean literal cookouts, I just mean any gathering of people, of my people, right? That I don't have to worry about my identity. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry mm -hmm. about, like, the music, the feeling, there's so much, like, just nurture and love in that, and just to not be under a microscope. Just to not, I mean, um, I've been to places, um, you know, recently I went to Atlanta, and I was at an art museum and it was like this event where people were dancing and everything like that. There were a lot of people of color, people from different um, backgrounds, you know, on the dance floor. Um, and there was, there was a woman who, a uh, European American woman who was standing off to the side and the look that she had on her face was kind of like, um, 
it, it was, she looked kind of slightly entertained, kind of, but she wasn't mm. participating. Mm. She was just watching mm -hmm. as if we were entertainment instead of participating. So I think the idea for me of a cookout is like to not have to worry about a gaze mm -hmm. that, um, that others me. Yeah. I would ditto that for sure. Um, I'm trying to think about joy specifically. I think, okay, so one thing that I think um, is black joy for me, or Ashley joy, since I'm already black, the joy of Ashley. Um, <laughs> Ashley joy. Is um, feeling, feeling in community, but like on the page as well. And even beyond the page, like feeling community in poetry. Like I think this yes. little trio is yes. poetry, like mm -hmm. alive. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes me feel very joyful to mm -hmm. know that I'm not alone mm -hmm. at all. You mm -hmm. know, that I can be my authentic self. I can be whatever weirdness I am that day. And mm -hmm. black women who are awesome, like will accept me and we can write together. We can share poems. Like that's so joyful yes. to me to know that I'm in the lineage of our foremothers who did the same thing with each yes. other um, and yes. to know that I can model that for people coming after us so they can see that it's not dog eat dog whatever people mm -hmm. say about the writing industry mm -hmm. yes it's like wild in the writing industry yeah. but the like the heart of it and of course we know that writing is not just the industry it's mm -hmm. something totally different it's mm -hmm. a soul sort of thing mm -hmm. that part of it is amazing to me mm -hmm. and it does feel very much like we're all dancing and nobody's watching us or asking us oh can you show me that dance can you do that little dance that you all do like we're just doing it mm -hmm. for each other to remind each other that we are here and alive so that's why yes. she's poet laureate that's why she's poet laureate <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes yes um so for me black joy is all of that and it's always <laughs> undergirded by me, by music. There's like a yes. soundtrack in my Absolutely. head yeah. to yeah. Black Joy. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. To be free, to be in community. Mm. Awesome. Next question was you. Yes. That's a great question. Um, I, I don't think people who are ignorant, uh, I think that people who are ignorant also need love. Yeah. And I can't, if you don't know, I can't hold it against you that you don't know. Mm -hmm. When I tell you and you still act <laughs> the same way, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like that, that's when it's a problem to me. If you're completely unaware, you just don't know, you can't help that you don't know. There are mm -hmm. things that I don't know. Yeah. You know, I'm a human being. There are things I don't know. Um, you know, I can offend someone else. So if I want to be forgiven, in my mind, I also have to forgive. At the same time, I'm not going to put up with someone trying to intentionally hurt or intentionally ignore after I've already let them know the mm -hmm. truth. Um, I really believe that um, you should love all people, not just for them, but for yourself. And I think you should forgive people, not just for them, but for yourself, mm -hmm. because you don't want to carry all of that around in you. Mm -hmm. And I write poetry because I am a black woman in the state of Alabama, and I am often surrounded by crazy people. <laughs> But I love this state. I love this state. I love the people in this state. Um, I have a, a crazy neighbor who is probably, you know, like racist as possible. 
but this is how he acts. If he, he was driving down the street one day and I was at my car and some, some weird person like was about to accost me, he pulled his truck up and he stayed right there and he basically said, you know, was gonna be there to make sure I got in my car safely because he's still my neighbor and I'm still his neighbor. And so, and that's kind of Alabama. It's a weird place, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think you should love all people. I still love all people. I still call it out. I call it out when I see it, you know? I don't let people get away with it. But I think also you can love people from a distance, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can love them from a distance and that's okay. Um, I wish no one ill will, even, for, even people who wish me ill will. Um, yes and yes. Um, all that I would add to that is to think about our definition of love. Mm -hmm. I um, talk about this a lot when I talk about like why I came back to Alabama and why I also love Alabama and try to tell everybody who's not from here to please visit here. <laughs> yes. and stop pretending like this is a circle of hell. Like <laughs> you know, um, I mean, if we're honest, mm -hmm. maybe the whole country is that circle. Mm -hmm. But yes. um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's at least pretty here. If it is, yes. well, it's lovely. Um, but I, I, would, I would complicate what we say when we say we love someone. I think if you really love someone or something, you have to, as Jackie said, call it out. Mm -hmm. And as Koya said, let them know. Mm -hmm. You have to do that. So sometimes mm -hmm. that love will look like, you know, hey, person who's <laughs> calling my school and saying I shouldn't teach this thing because it's going to hurt their child's mm -hmm. feelings. This is yeah. why I'm doing it. Here's why I'm going to keep doing it. Why don't you want me to do it? Love yourself enough to figure out what your issue is. That's mm -hmm. right. I have no issue with doing this. And you're not going to make me have an issue with doing it. <laughs> right. So really, the work is on you to invite yourself into yourself mm -hmm. and interrogate yourself. Um, and sometimes that's how to get through that. Other times, um, distance is good. Um, sometimes love looks like goodbye. We can't, <laughs> we can't be mm -hmm. together. We can't be friends in the way that you want us to be because this thing keeps happening. You keep hurting me. You keep saying these things that are horrible. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult, but I think everything and everyone is worth love in whatever way that looks. Um, and that's not an easy thing to say because there are plenty of people who we all write about, yeah. which I, I mean, I don't want to sit with them. I don't want them to like know me or I don't want to bake them a cake or whatever. <laughs> like I don't like them, but I do love their existence and I wish them to understand love because then they wouldn't suck so much. So <laughs> there was one more question. There are two hands. <laughs> uh, we, well, we could do both. We can do both. Let's yeah, do let's both. do both. You can't deny anyone. Um, I was like, in, in the poetry world and as women and as public authors, how do you guys deal with invaders, uh, imposter syndrome? And <laughs> also, do you ever feel like you have to justify yourself as like writers and yes. women? And, you know, <laughs> to like answer sort of like, well, what are you doing with your life? And like, I'm <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah um, imposter I'll, I'm gonna start because I don't want to follow y'all anymore that's a bad plan for my life um, cause you guys say such good things and I'm just trying to come up with something so I will start by saying yes I do deal with imposter syndrome I don't know anybody who doesn't honestly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would be very concerned about someone who didn't feel mm -hmm. a little bit of like yeah. oh am I doing this right you know like if you're always completely sure of what you're doing <laughs> No. I don't know. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely times, honestly, almost every time I get up to teach, I'm like, hmm, really? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm about to say something to all these people and they're gonna like believe what I say. <laughs> um, it's like a really wild concept when you think about it. Um, anyway, so there's that. And, and being a poet too, um, sometimes you feel, or I have felt, oh, I'm not as creative as that poet. And oh goodness, I don't belong in this room with mm -hmm. this poet. And their metaphor is just otherworldly. I'm never going to be able to do that. Of course you feel that. But I also think it's sort of healthy to challenge yourself against that feeling and to always feel like you have something else to learn. 
Um, again, like I said before, if you ever feel like I've mastered it all, I'm the best there is, maybe not, you know, <laughs> like there's, a, a, there's goodness in a healthy amount of um, wanting to improve and always questioning if there's more you can learn. As far as justifying myself to aunties, um, I am lucky to have a family that does not question me in that way. Um, and I didn't know that was like unusual until I went to art school and everybody was like, my family doesn't want me to be an artist. <laughs> like, oh, I can't relate to that, my family is cool. The only stipulation is that we had to get a job. All my siblings are artsy too. And my parents were like, yeah, we love it. Also be able to feed yourself. <laughs> yeah. And so it never was a conflict for me. Um, and I never treated it like something to hide. Um, but again, I know that's not typical. A lot of people have to really fight to accepting that as a career for themselves. Um, so I would say to that, if you are in a family that, where people are just like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Maybe, you know, find your people elsewhere who can give you that encouragement so mm -hmm. that when you go back to your family, you can walk into the room and say, I'm a poet, period, right. you know. Yeah, I um, always encourage my, my students because I know we, sometimes we put up these, uh, we put this distance between what we do in our families. Like, mm. have you gone home and read a poem at Thanksgiving mm -hmm. for your family? Mm. You know, like go home and read a poem to your family at Thanksgiving. Like bring them into what you're doing and demystify it. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, you know, they're out there being a writer instead of that. <laughs> and I mean, I've had my family, my family made fun of me a lot oh, no. when I was saying that I, you know, was doing writing. And even, I, you know, right before I started graduate school, um, I had had a little bit of like, you know, when I won a couple, of, I won a, a couple of undergraduate awards, which I was very lucky to win. And uh, they came up for that, and they're like, okay, you know, they just <laughs> didn't know this thing was something that was serious for me. But they also would tease me about it. So anytime something came out, why don't you write a poem about it? Go write a, go write a poem about this. Why don't you write a poem about that? Oh you know, write a poem about the time that that boy beat you up. Oh you know, and you're in the dirt and I pulled up and you're in daycare. Like, why don't you write a poem about that? Oh my God. So, so um, that's kind of like, but my family teases really, really hard and I think that, that teasing kind of comes into my own work. Like sometimes I like, you know, what people call the dozens where you're doing, you know, like your mom is so dumb, she sat on the TV and watched the couch. That's what right. I mean, I bring that into my writing sometimes because my family, they tease so hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I just feel like you have to kind of know what you're doing and you have to, it's really up to you to make it this is what I'm doing, this is important to me, this is valuable to me, and I have to protect this. And if I have to protect this from the people that are supposed to be close to me and love me, then I'll have to do that until they get over it, until they see that this is something real for me, and this can make a way for me, this can make a path for me that you just haven't seen before. So I'm just gonna tell you what I've learned. I started out my life, I started writing when I was like six years old. I wrote poetry. I went to, um, um, I went to, I started off graduate school to be a poet. My mother died, I went home, I got a job. And um, I got a job at an institution and uh, they wanted me to go back to school to finish up graduate school. And um, they said, but you need to get the PhD, not the MFA because there's no creative writing here. And I did that. And I stopped writing for decades. And my husband said to me one day, when I was 50 years old, you're not happy. I was a tenured full professor, and he said to me, you're not happy. And I said, what do you mean? I'm happy, what, what's that? He said, no, no, you're not writing. And so at 50 years old, after having tried to be a poet, had studied with Gary Hongo and Chase Twitchell, and had just given that up, given that up completely, I started on this journey to be the poet I always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Don't waste 
30 years of your life trying to please somebody else. Do you, do you. Reverend Dr. Jackie Trimble. <laughs> I'm, saying. I'm saying. Yes. Um, okay. So I know we have one more person if you want to ask that question. So. Uh, I think this is for Robbie uh, and this is very fine. I wanted to go on about uh, asking a really gap between both generations. Not that I think you're all old, but you get it for me. <laughs> Thank and you. And the new way people write, and then that becomes very. But I think that way it just ended up being like. Okay, thank you. We will end there. Thank we'll you for being so gracious. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening and for your energy. And we will sign and sell books if you would like them. Thanks again. <laughs>